What's up, guys? This is Viet, host of the BBYK podcast, part of the BSPN Radio Network, your one-stop shop for sports, MMA, and the meaning of life. This episode, we are going to be breaking down the big fight, the title for the baddest man on the planet. And as these guys are both over level 9,000 in power, they're really going to have to go beyond Super Saiyan. You're going to love this. Trust me, what you're seeing now is my normal state. This is a Super Saiyan. And this, this is what is known as a Super Saiyan that has ascended past a Super Saiyan. Or, you could just call this a Super Saiyan 2. Help me break down an incredible weekend of fights, Beltro 192 and UFC 220. I got my good friend, fight consultant, Mr. Tyler Dubarito Dollinger. What's up, Ty? GSP number one. Still on that. Still <laughs> on that. We'll never forget. <laughs> if this being one of one, we've never heard of Tyler again. <laughs> I'd still be crying in a corner. <laughs> And then uh, my my good friend who is all aboard the Gaines train, Matt Two Stripe Alexander. What's up, Matt? Um, I don't know what to say. Uh, I can't handle this pressure. <laughs> <laughs> all right, fair enough. And uh, I also want to point out, Matt, you did send me some uh, some, some notes before <laughs> before the show. Uh, so maybe we'll get to to some of them. The first thing, because you can't be an MMA podcast and not talk about Conor McGregor these days. I don't know if you guys heard, but Conor, is he supposed to be stripped of his belt this weekend? Well, Dana said that it was not going to happen, so it probably is going to happen. <laughs> right, right. That's that's like one of those things where like you hear something sort of from the UFC, but then like Dana comes out and is like, it's definitely not going to happen, which <laughs> usually guarantees that something probably will happen. Um but I mean, what are you guys feeling about that in general? Like, is this kind of jumping the gun? Should the UFC strip Connor of the belt? I mean, obviously, there's a lot of fighters and fans out there that have been saying this for a while, and Connor hasn't exactly helped the case by kind of going a little cray cray after his loss to Mayweather in their boxing match last August. So I'm gonna start with you, Matt. What do you think? Should he be stripped? Yes, because both Tony Ferguson and Khabib have had excellent last showings and they're obviously going to be ready for a fight before connor is which is surprising (laughs) considering it be was like just fought he's not due up for a fight for another like two years Um, (laughs) (laughs) so you're you are you are with el kukui a defender vacate yeah because then that way um, if they just say all right we're stripping it of him and then putting khabib versus Tony for it. They can always bring Connor back later and be like, oh, it's another title fight that we wanted. Whereas if Connor comes back now decades or fights first, it might be a while before he fights the next comer and then you'd have to hear Tony be like, M- McNuggets, you're like <laughs> Mc- McFlurrying my Mc sandwich and Mc McChicken and Mc uh, um. Yeah. And then we would die ahead a pile of cringe. Yeah. Hashtag sponsor. Hashtag sponsor. <laughs> What do you think, Tyler? Uh, 
you know what? With the uh, the new um, the new regime there at the UFC, I say make tons of interim belts, and then you can have interim belt tournaments. They're already for, doing that. Stop this. This is horrible. <laughs> yeah, so you have to have tournaments to win an interim belt, and then you have interim belt tournaments to win the quote unquote real belt, and then you probably got to fight three more times to actually get the real belt. Somebody's going to get a job offer from the UFC tomorrow. <laughs> They're like, that's brilliant. <laughs> we should just do that. <laughs> Here's here's all my ideas on an Excel spreadsheet. What do you say it is you do here? You're like, uh, I probably do about 15 minutes of work a day, and when I just come up with a rate crazy ideas, like, wow, that'd be great. And then I'm just gonna be sitting in the corner, and yeah, Dana White took my swing line stapler. <laughs> Oh, my uh, my efficiency levels are Whoa, really dang. just based you on. You guys ordering. can't even see this. You guys can't even see this because the the video is not going to work. We are going to start doing video here at BBYK. We heard the fans. We're going to start doing that for 2018. We're not going to do it for this one, but it did just show off his really sweet swing line stapler. That's legit candy apple red. I mean that that, that thing that is the pro, the, the pro the model. The, the pro model. No one can see it. <laughs> but, All metal. Uh, very, yep, very only the best up here in Canada. Yep. Well, as you, as you already brought up, Matt. Well, <laughs> surprisingly, we have heard from Dana that Khabib and Ferguson will be fighting UFC 223. It will happen. My question is, but will it actually happen, though? I think it might actually happen this time because fiftieth time's a charm, and Khabib looks in much better shape. Like physically, read actually on weight and not going to be two hundred pounds. Um, and Tony's always up and has weird looking ears, and it's the fight that all the cool fans want to see that has never happened before. And that's it. Tony's professional. Like he'll be there. Khabib, he just he just had to cut out the tiramisu from his diet. But how does that affect his fight game, bro? That's a huge asset that he's leaving on the table. <laughs> right. Yeah, and tiramisu is delicious. Hmm. Yeah, so I, I think I am with you guys. I think that Khabib, the winner of Khabib Ferguson, I think you're gonna have you you're gonna have the UFC put together like Connor's gonna take on the winner of that one for the real belt, unless you know something crazy comes along and you we have like a connor nate three or something like that and i think that's the fight people want to want to see they want to see connor fight either tony or khabib uh, i think it has you know just from like a like a fighting perspective it has the most merit you know uh, that really definitely tells you who's the top dog there at lightweight so that's the fight i, I you know we want to see that <laughs> i don't know <laughs> i don't know how much uh Connor wants Khabib, but <laughs> I think that's a pretty dangerous fight for him. I think Ferguson's a a tough fight for him too. Those those are both really tough guys. So um, excited that it's at least announced. Hopeful that it will happen. All right, my next question for you guys. It actually has to deal with this card, and it's just a hypothetical. But at UFC 220, if Daniel Cormier loses, do you see him retiring that night? Tyler, I'm going to throw this to you. You know, there's, there's an obvious reason that Cormier has started doing as much TV as he's done. Uh, he's getting up there in age as far as the UFC fighter goes. But when you look at a commentator or an analyst or a UFC field reporter for whatever insert sports station here, he's well in his prime. Um. And he's he's fought some big fights, and you know he's riding around with some damage on that body. Do I think he would go out in, in the press conference that night and say, I'm done? Probably not. But uh, would he take another fight after a loss? Uh, I, I don't know. I think, he, I think he might give up at that point. I think he might just say, I make a lot of TV money now. I like TV money. That's where he goes. Yeah, likes that likes that cake and chicken. Wouldn't have to worry. Hey, it's, a, it's, a, it's a grind, man. That's a grind. Going through those fight camps, it's it's not. I'm, like, I get these guys; they love it, but 
he's he already you know some of those fighters they might be they may be thinking like all right what's next like this is still like i'm making money fighting for a guy like Cormier, it's like, well, I have other avenues. I've already established other ways for to support my family, and and then also I, on the other hand, it's kind of like, do you do you want to put your family through that? Because when your <laughs> when your dad is a is a UFC fighter, that's awesome, right? But it's also like you're super worried every single time he has to go in there and compete with world class athletes um, to not kind of put that on his family. I could maybe see it, depending on how. I think if it's a bad loss, like if he gets his butt kicked or knocked out, I think there might be a, a chance he he retires. What do What do you think, Matt? I think he might retire if he gets knocked out, but um, yeah, I don't think it's going to be that night. I think there's a good possibility that depending on if the fight is right, he'll take another one. I don't think he wants to go out on a loss. Um, but given that he's you know older, and if he he loses the title again, UFC may or may not want to put him up against another like up and comer in a division that is kind of like already out of up and comers. So if he gets the right fight, he could have another one four to six months from after a loss, beat somebody that's like five to ten range, and then retire like. Right out in a blaze of glory with a another dominant win over like not a top three opponent. Yeah. Um, but it is also it also depends on how uh, how the aftermath. It's like let's say he gets knocked out and he doesn't get back to training right. I could see it going the other way too, where he's like you know try to continue on not hitting the same level um, or like the standard that he's used to, and and maybe calling it quits then. Yeah, it's tough because you know, like he's he is the champion. He's technically the champion, but it's, this is these are not the circumstances that he wanted to be a champion under. Like it, it's just the most ridiculous set of circumstances where you you lose <laughs> and you're still the champion. Um, you know, just chalk that up to uh, just a bunch of issues that John Jones is is going through. But he's accomplished. A lot. I think he's still clearly, even at his age, the top dog in that division. But he's one of the best fighters, I, in my opinion, of, of all time in that weight class. He, he, I think it, it sucks for him because he will be more remembered as the guy that lost to John Jones twice. But I think if you just go, hey, John Jones is just like he was one of those, like once in a lifetime, like one of those goat type fighters and then you just look at dc as just like look at him and you take those losses out that guy has accomplished just about anything like anyone could hope to accomplish in the sport so if he decided to leave that would be uh no big deal he might want to do something like um what uh geez michael bisping is is doing where you know he lost the belt and then now he wants that retirement fight um over in London uh, and then go off on a win. I could see that too. Uh, but um, either way, I, he's, that's got to be on his mind. I think retirement is right around the corner for this guy. And, and he's, got so many, he's got so many other great things. He has so many awesome opportunities. So, it, you know. <laughs> you know what I don't want to see is him losing the fight and then saying, I want to fight John Jones one more time. Ooh, that would be bad. Yeah, I don't be weak. think he's going to do Man, I don't know. I think... I think that would be something you would consider, and it, I don't think it would be good. But you yeah, know, because he would have the platform uh, on that on that day every night, calling those fights, <laughs> calling out John Jones. That would that would not be a good look. That would not be a good look. I would hope that he has people in this corner, like like you, Tyler. Maybe you should <laughs> after. Uh, after you, the you George St. Pierre music. fan club <laughs> is at your disposal, Cormier. <laughs> All right, guys. I'm, I want to describe to you a, a, a fighter real quick. He is he is an excellent fight analyst. Uh, he's very well spoken. He's been in a bunch of different movie roles, uh, heavily involved in the local community and, and a bunch of local charities. Uh, as a fighter, he's very talented, and he has incredible knockout power. Does that sound like a star to you guys? Probably. 
Is that not Tito Ortiz? Is that not who we're talking about? <laughs> I am talking about Tyrone Woodley, who was recently on Joe Rogan Experience, Joe Rogan's podcast, and I listened to the some of it. But mainly the takeaway is just the the hate that he kind of generated. Like people listen to that, they're like, "Man, we really hate." Woodley, we just like really don't like him. Like, what, what is it? What is it about him, Matt? Like, what, what is it like? Because I know you're not the biggest fan of him, and and the thing is, if Woodley, if you're listening to this, that has nothing to do with Matt not respecting you as a fighter. Can we just say that? Can we respect someone as a fighter, but just not like them? Yes, I, I think like he he mistakes respect for love. I don't. I think he gets a lot of respect. Like you, you fought Stephen Thompson, who in my opinion is like the second best welterweight on the planet, twice. Uh, you're really good, and I respect you as a fighter. But he just – what's it about this guy, Matt? What is it about this guy? Um, There's a chip on his shoulder, but there's not, like, a fire or charisma to go with it. So it's just like, dude, you're boring. No one cares. Um, he's not a very good trash talker. And while well, he's got – Knockout. Knockout. Kobe, Kobe Queefington. <laughs> oh. <laughs> like, that was really good. <laughs> South Park is about to sign you up. He's got knockout power, but he look he's very strategic and smart about, you know, his championship fights and not overextending himself, but it often makes for not very interesting fights. And then you combine that with like him saying like, dude, I, I deserve like the big fights, the GSP thing, like, I would totally wreck Connor and all these people, I'm a bigger star. I'm like, dude, no one cares because your personality is boring and your fights are boring and that's why no one likes you. I actually think, like, when he's not whining, for a lack of a better term, he actually is, like, his. he actually has a bit of a personality. I, listening to him break down fights, I'm like, that's, he's very yeah. smart. Like, he's very spot on. And apparently, like, um, he was recently at some comedy club. They brought him up there, and, like, he was, like, you know, he had the the room just, like, in tears. Like, he, he can be a pretty funny dude. And, you know, you hear just from other people around him, like, he, he's liked by his inner circle. Like, yeah. They think he's a cool guy. I just... To me, I, I can sort of understand where he's coming from, where it's on on one hand, he he hates the fact that like because of the way the modern like fighting game has has evolved into this, you know, you need to be a showman. Like there's a little bit of that WWE in the UFC now, and that's just part of the sport. And that it Connor didn't start that, but Connor kind of mm-hmm. took it to a level that was a little in my opinion, just uh, it kind of did a disservice because you had a lot of people trying to follow in his footsteps and Connor is really a lightning in a bottle scenario. It was just like a bunch of right things at the right time and a guy that kind of had all the stuff necessary to, to pull it off, uh, including the, the chops, the fighting chops. And Tyron yeah. has some of that, but it's like he wants that now. He wants to demand those fights now and it's it's a different position. It, you you got to wait a little bit and, and you know, maybe be in a different position to kind of call for those things. And instead, what we see as, the, as fans is a guy who kind of, you know, seems like he's walking through quicksand before we can book him fights because he's trying to look for these money fights. But the end result is Woodley is taking on the best guys. He took on Thompson. He took on Maya. He is defending this belt. You know, and and often, so it's just a a real a real enigma, a real enigma. And I, I bring him up before I segue into Bellator 192 because the co-main event there features a guy who many consider one of the top five welterweights on the planet, and a guy that has beaten Woodley. So I just think I just think it's a very it's a very interesting position. I don't know. I know Woodley just recently had some so- shoulder. Um, injury that he is uh, I guess they took some the way he described it took stem cells from like his back or something and then they kind of injected them into his shoulder whatever it is it it sounds um, overly complicated but it sounds like he's on the mend but he will be out for a bit Uh, so who knows who knows Um, RDA looked awfully good in his last fight 
I think that's probably like a guy that the UFC is maybe going to push. So we'll see. Mm-hmm. But Bellator 192. So we got two big cards this weekend, UFC 220. We got Bellator 192. And really, we were talking about this, Tyler, you and I, before the show. This, We really only care about the top two fights about yeah. from both cards. It seemed like both, both uh, organizations were like, the top two fights on our cards are so good. It really doesn't matter <laughs> who who fills out the rest of the card, but let's just get into this really quickly. Uh, the co-main event, the first one for a, the first fight, is a welterweight title fight between Rory McDonald and Lima. Now, um, Matt, I'm just going to ask you real quick: What are your thoughts on that fight? Who do you think is going to win? Um, got to go with Rory, but I think it's going to be very cool. Uh, Lima looked pretty awesome in his last fight. Yeah. Um, and Rory looks back like, you know, he's been really consistent in Bellator. Um, just looks, you know, like on another level than everybody else. Uh, I think this should be pretty good. Um, not sure if Rory's going to finish him, though. I think it might be like a very solid five-rounder. Yeah. Do you think, you think he's going to put on a clinic or do you think he'll be back and forth? It'll be a little back and forth. Um I could see maybe that. maybe not a clinic, but um, he'll he'll do enough to win, say maybe four rounds. I could see it, and and Tyler, we were talking ahead of time, and your thing about Rory was elite world talent, right? You you to you it was the consistency um, issue, and and he, he has looked a lot more consistent <laughs> since he's been in Bellator. But how much do we chalk that up to just a lower level of competition? Well, sure, you have that. Um, and now you're putting him up against like Bellator's best champion in the in the division. And, I mean, the uh, uh, Lima's been banged up before, so we'll see if that plays much of a factor. Um, yeah, you know, I was a huge fan of Rory because Rory was supposed to be the next GSP, and so I had to start a new fan club for that. <laughs> yes. And so. You know, I cried a little bit when he went to Bellator, but you also looked at that like, hey, this is Rory's second coming, right? Like when you, a starter varsity guy suddenly goes to JV, like he's going to do all right. We hope, mm-hmm. we think so far, but uh, now he's going up against a guy with uh, some pretty solid talent in there. So we'll, we'll see which Rory walks out of the cage. I mean, I don't know. Consistency in fighters is always kind of a weird thing, right? Yeah. But obviously, I'm pulling for Rory. I mean, you know, I still got the paperwork for his fan club in the in the right. back drawer. So you know, I I, yeah. I I heard in a recent interview, Rory was complaining because he was actually trying to look for. He wanted to buy the domain name RoryMcDonald.com, and I was like, "Sorry, bro. Tyler bought that a long time ago." <laughs> Tyler is so all in on Rory. It's like Rory was big into Bitcoin, and Tyler was like, "You know what? I don't even know what this is. I don't know what cryptocurrency is, but I'm investing. <laughs> I'm all in." He's he's still trying to. Tyler's still trying to go to restaurants. He's like, "Do you guys take Bitcoin? Is that how it works?" No one ex- <laughs> no one explained it to me, but Rory McDonald believes in it, and I believe in it. <laughs> if he says so, it is so. All right, guys. And the main event is the first leg of this year's big heavyweight Grand Prix uh, event that Bellator is putting on, basically a a tournament for heavyweights, or as Tyler pointed out more accurately, bloated light heavyweights. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Maybe sprinkle in a couple middleweights, because Sonnen actually fought most of his yeah. fights at middleweight. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So uh, so you got Chel Sonnen, uh, the uh, the gangster from West Lynn, um, a, a guy who I, I think in many ways you could credit Conor McGregor's presence. You know, Chael Sonnen kind of paved the path. Uh, Chael, maybe not as, as skilled as Conor, didn't have as much success, but, oh, he was awfully close. He was 30 seconds away from beating Anderson Silva. So uh, he was really close to having just like – uh, a champion. So actually, he was close there, and I think he was seconds away from uh, a 
John Jones. John Jones against John Jones because John Jones he, he had that toe. yeah broke his toe. They would have called the fight if they went to the corner, but I, you know you don't want to win. <laughs> you don't want to be champion because because <laughs> I'm pretty sure John Jones even with nine toes would still beat Sonnen. But uh, <laughs> correction, so, he did beat. Him. Yeah, he did. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Man, that's why we have Matt, the, the fact checker. All right, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna just go throw it to you, Matt. What do you think's gonna? Uh, how are you feeling? Are you excited at all? By the way, by this, like this is, like this is like this was so awesome, like in like 2007. <laughs> like, yeah. Wow. Like 20 year old me was really stoked for this. Um, <laughs> I think Sonnen is going to have 14 minutes and 40 seconds of top control. And <laughs> Oh, wait. Is it a five-round fight? Sorry. Make that 24 and a half minutes of top control. <laughs> uh, he might win by submission, but it's going to be boring as hell. Yeah, this could be a real dud. It, it could be a real <laughs> dud. And I, Rampage actually has, you know, when he was in his prime, had really excellent takedown defense but what what are we gonna see from these guys that sonin versus vanderlei fight was such a letdown it was like bad blood from all these years that their <laughs> skirmish on ufc uh tough brazil was, that was better that was better <laughs> that was much more interesting like <laughs> than their their actual fight ended up being tyler who are you calling this one sonin or Rampage. I'm gonna go with my boy Page, but I'm not expecting a ton out of him. There was a he had an interview right around the time. Actually, this was funny. Bellator announced the tournament. Announced he was in the tournament, but nobody had told Rampage. <laughs> so he's in the interview, and the interviewer was like, "Hey, so how excited are you about the tournament?" And Page is like, "I don't know what you're talking about." <laughs> 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 so then in typical rampage fashion he's like yeah whatever i don't care i'll fight in the tournament whatever i'll fight sure you know just don't stick me in there with no wrestler because i don't want somebody just grab my ankle the whole time and then it's announced he's gonna fight <laughs> Chel so like i think rampage has got a little bit of like pent-up anger and aggression and I, that might be the tipping point sweet oh, i hope i don't know I so. it, it, it's gonna be such a weird fight it, you're right. Like ten years ago, man, I'd have like I'd have flown out to Vegas for this one. Like this would have been a heck of a fight. And now I'm kind of worried. It's just going to be watching a couple old guys out there. Just yep. I think it's gonna. I, I think there's high high dud potential with this fight. High high dud potential. Uh, <laughs> and can you imagine if this was a pride fight way back when? Though, like, how cool would this have been in their pride? Yeah, that would have been sweet. In Japan. <laughs> yes. <Yeah. laughs> With the, what, what was her name? The the, the announcer lady? Oh. Rampage! <laughs> 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 it would have been great. Someone would have gotten laid out in the ropes. <laughs> It'd be great. Cup of noodles. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> yeah. I, I, <laughs> dude, cup of noodles, man. That was so awesome. <laughs> That's not who. Who is that for? Is that one, one FC? Or no, no, no. It's Ryzen. Ryzen. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Ryzen. <laughs> but they're, yeah. it's so funny. They're they're uh, <laughs> their mascot is cup of noodles, man. <laughs> And he's like this huge jack dude under the thing, and you can't see anything about him. But you're like, yeah, he could be heavyweight champ. <laughs> it's all about that face mask they had on the front of the cup. <laughs> That's how you knew he meant business. Hilarious! It was hilarious. I like, I, I, you know, Rampage. He's like, he was always funny. I remember seeing him on Twitch, and he was playing um, like UFC, the UFC video game, and. It was like he was mad because everyone that played against him was like beating him up, and he refused to play as anyone else. He played as himself. Yeah. He was like, "Man, they, I hate this. Like, I'm like way better than this. <laughs> like horrible. I'm like losing to everyone." <laughs> and then uh, he was like complaining against someone playing against them, um, like Chuck Liddell. They played Chuck Liddell against them, and like he won. And Chuck Liddell was like doing some moves, like a flying knee or something. He's like, "Chuck's never done that in his life. Why does he have this move?" And and he was like, I, I can't really complain, though, because I can do a spinning back kick, and I've never done one of those in my life. <laughs> so, uh, be 
be fun. It's a, it's a, it's nostalgic. It's for us fight fans. That's what Bellator is kind of banking on. We're like, oh yeah, we love Chell, we love Rampage. We tune in and we we watch it. It's gonna be free. It's it's actually gonna be on um, Paramount. I guess they. I don't know if they bought out Spike or whatever. It is a rebrand. Rebrand of Spike. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, so it's going to be on Paramount. So check your local listings, but that should be free. If you're like us, you'll probably just have both on at the same time. All right, let's get into this UFC 220 fight, the first one to kick off this year, their anniversary, their 25-year anniversary. Um, you know, like, like I said at the beginning of the podcast, I think we're mainly going to focus on the two big fights here. Just a quick shout-out to uh, Crash Bokniak. Um, hoping them all yeah, the yeah. best, and then also uh, as Matt pointed out in his his notes that he sent to me, these were great notes by the way. Uh, this this Almeida font fight, do not sleep on that. It's kicking off the main card. Could be fight of the night. A lot of fireworks. And, um, who who are you uh, who are you picking in that one, Matt? If I keep betting on Thomas Almeida. He's going to win one of these times. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm betting on Thomas Almeida to get the comeback. He's one and two in his last two fights. A um, little disappointing. Um, neither of these guys have great defense, which has been his kind of problem over his last two losses. But um, both of them are extremely aggressive. And I don't know. I just want to see him win. <laughs> You are exactly yeah. why Vegas exists today because <laughs> these dice are gonna roll my way. <laughs> <laughs> they do though. Yeah. Sometimes they do. And and then sometimes you just you just live on with eternal regret. <laughs> and bankruptcy. And and, and debt. <laughs> <laughs> and broken legs from the loan sharks. <laughs> All right, let's uh, let's get into this co-main. It's a title fight for light heavyweight belt between Daniel Cormier and Vulcan Osmer. I love the name Vulcan. Like that is a fighter's name. It's, it sounds like like the bad guy in like some like eighties movie, like Metal Vulcan. Gear Solid Three. Metal Gear Solid <laughs> Vulcan. So, so the, the Vulcans are the good guys in Star Trek, right? <laughs> Just saying. True. But Vulcan could also mean Vulcan from the Latin, from the Greek Hephaestus, which means he's a gimpy cuckold who makes stuff. Wow. One of you was really nerdy, and then one of you turned around and was really geeky. This, this went to strange territory, my friends. <laughs> this is uh, fun. It's, it is fun. Let's just get into it. You know, Vulcan, he earned this shot beating the guy that kind of talked his way into being sort of that other man. It's, you know, for forever, that light heavyweight division has been a two-horse race. It was really kind of, everyone was just waiting for DC and John Jones to fight again. And, um, and then they did. And, you know, DC lost. And like we pointed out earlier, um, John Jones, you know, his, his drug test came back, um, had some, uh, I forget the name of the the, the steroid now, but uh, turbinol, turbinol. Yeah, that that sounds about right. It was not a good look, especially given his history. It was not something, you know. It it did not. It it was not the storybook ending because you know he beat he beat Cormier and then he he wasn't his his you know the John Jones we saw in the first fight. He was a lot more humble. And, and gracious almost towards Cormier. And I think a lot of fans, myself included, were kind of like, hey, this is it. This was the uh, – this is kind of like the – like in the movies, like this is the hero kind of like effed up, like came back, learned the air of his ways, like worked hard, like came back, reclaimed what was once his and is now a better person for it. <laughs> and then he – Wasn't that literally the plot of Fighter? I don't – Yeah. I don't, <laughs> <laughs> or every other boxing fighting yeah, movie yeah any yeah. any shonen style chosen one trope then you had the guy that was trying to talk his way into being that the the contender the winner the the guy that will take on the winner of that fight and that was jimmy manuel ozdemir went in he beat him so now you know you beat the man you become the man 
It's now Ozdemir stat guy. And he had himself a hell of a 2017. Uh, three three victories. The the last one against Jimmy Manoa, his biggest win to date. These are two pressure fighters, and they they kind of do it different ways. Um, so we're just we're just gonna kind of start the breakdown now. Tyler, I'm gonna start with you on this one. How do you see this this fight playing out? You know, Cormier has always looked really good in the octagon, and like, I mean, I remember when the before the first um, Jones fight, like you were thinking Cormier is the guy who could actually beat John Jones. Like John Jones is killing everyone. Cormier is killing everyone. I think Cormier could kill John Jones, and then he didn't, and we were all sad. But then he still got the belt because little did we know John Jones is about as bright as a potato. So <laughs> I have a hard time picking against Cormier in this fight, even though we kind of talked about age and stuff earlier. Um, you've got a guy in Vulcan that's not, he doesn't have a lot of time in the octagon. He's a heck of a fighter. I mean, you can't take that away from him younger, but I think Cormier can get past him this time. Um, and then I think if you gave, uh, I think if you gave the Swiss man like two more years, you might see him holding the strap for a while. Matt, how do you see this playing out? I see it possibly like the Dan Henderson fight with Cormier. Um, <laughs> ragdolling him? <laughs> just ragdolling him and avoiding the, uh, avoiding getting KO'd, though. Ozdemir has much more precise boxing, and I think that is um, a pretty big deal and plus for him uh, in his path to victory. His bro blueprint to rule the octagon. Um, but I also see Cormier being smart enough to work his comparative advantage and either clinch up or just take him down straight away. Um and maybe get a submission out of it. Um, he's usually pretty solid if he can gain top control for any amount of time, you know, like a good amount of time, like for rounds. So, yeah. I don't know, it depends on how it goes. Um, but I, I, I'm i fairly confident in saying that Cormier's got it. I mean, I, why why would Cormier do anything but go to, like, why would he stand yeah. in, you know, why would he stand and bang? Like, that wouldn't, I feel like that would be the worst idea he could have, right? Like, he's got to go to ground with this guy. Yeah, with, so. a, with, a, this. with a talented kickboxer. And, you know, maybe he just wants to show he's he's got some some legit stand-up, too. Now, you know, his, his stand-up was always like his teammate, like Kane's. A lot of feints and fakes, you know, he throws out that jab. He's, he's not... The, uh, the tallest or, or widest guy. I mean, he's wide, but not the longest reach in that division. So, you know, he really has to kind of use his, his feints and his jabs and, and then kind of measures the distance, slip and rip, and then work his way inside. That seems to be Cormier's game, get his hooks in and, and then just really make you work. I think that you said um, this is going to look a lot like Hendo. I think he said that this, you know, he was taking – he was looking at the same notes for this fight as he did for uh, Vulcan's teammate, uh, Anthony Johnson. Uh, how to like steer clear from those power shots, the striking, close that distance, and then get into that, that make it a grappling exchange because we don't really need to talk about the, the two-time Olympians you know, grappling uh, pedigree. This guy is one of the best in the business. When it comes to Vulcan, you know, this is a guy that will want to keep it standing up, a, a master at, at Thai kickboxing and Dutch kickboxing. He kind of combines them, the two of them together, likes to throw his combinations, uh, kind of goes with those, you know, your basic one, two, maybe a, a, a two, three, and then you'll follow it up with a, a body kick, a crushing body kick or something like that. And then and then he likes to also follow that back up with a left hook, a, a combination that he used on Jimmy Manawa. I think that Ostemir has shown improvements with his takedown defense. Uh, he's he's obviously he said that he's been working on his his wrestling a lot uh, ever since he's been moving 
ever since he made the move stateside to, to go to camps over here, um, he's been drilling, wrestling a lot. Um, if you see Ozdemir, if you see him in his fights, uh, usually if he gets taken down, he, he tends to turtle, but then like fight fight to get back to his base. He's, he's very intelligent. Like He'll fight the hands, and um, you know he can explode back up. It, it's really, that's all he wants to do. He really has no... Um, incentive to stay on the ground he wants to he wants to go back to his wheelhouse his his game which is um the stand-up game uh and against a guy like cormier he's really gonna have to be mindful because i i could see an opportunity there like just the way he likes to kind of like like i said the way he likes to turtle up or, or tripod to base and then and then he's you know he's really got the hand fight because if he does that he he risks giving up his back giving up his neck and and then that's going to be the exact same scenario that we saw with Anthony Johnson, where um, Cormier was able to take his back and and just weigh on him, and then and then sink in the choke. And uh, and another thing you want to uh, put in Cormier's, you know, it just like in his favor, he took a crazy shot from Anthony Johnson, a shot that probably would have killed other people, <laughs> and was still able to like move forward and take him down. It just yeah. tells you how tough this guy is. I know Jones finished him, but Vulcan is not John Jones. DC is still one of the best in the business. We were talking about it before the podcast. I, in my opinion, one of the best to ever do it in this division. I, I think that it, it kind of sucks that he's going to have that asterisk of the two John Jones losses, but I mean, when he fought John Jones, he was on that top 10 pound-for-pound pound list. He's an incredible fighter. I don't know if Vulcan is quite on his level yet. I know he's been trying to, John, uh, or Cormier has been pushing it out there. You know, this is JV. You know, I'm varsity. Like, you're not on my level. Uh, I don't know if Vulcan is buying into any of that at all. But also to so Tyler's. Roy, hmm? So Rory McDonald showed back up again? Is that what happened here? Is it? Roy McDonald's going to take over for us here. Is it, <laughs> I see. It's a switch out room oh, right there. I Dang. I'm back. calling it right now. DC by Twister in the second round. Does he? <laughs> does he have the can – he, can he actually leverage that with his body? Uh, is, too, is there too much gut? Might, in the, actually, the gut might actually help, right? <laughs> yeah. I think his legs need to be like a foot longer. <laughs> Yeah, so so you're saying if Cormier were seven feet tall, he, he would totally land that twister, bro. <laughs> All right, let's get to the main event. This is, you know, off of both cards, the Bellator card and the UFC card. This is why fight fans are going to be tuning in to watch any fight. If they're going to be watching any fight this weekend, they want to watch this fight. The crown for the baddest man on the planet, a guy that is as scary. A, of a man as they come in Francis Ngannou against the champ, Stipe Miocic. Now, man, I'm going to let you start with this, and you're saying, hey, guys, don't sleep on the champ. Yeah, don't sleep on the champ. Everyone has been disrespecting him since he was challenging for the belt the first time. They're like, oh, Verdum's going to have his Verdum troll face. Everyone's laughing. Ha, 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 ha. He's going to win. Oh, then he got knocked out. You're like, that's what I thought. Um, then he kind of had a scare against, what's his name? He uh, got knocked down against um, horse meat. Wolverine. Alex Wolverine. That was the phantom tap. He won that one, too. And they're like, oh, this one against JDS is going to be good. And like, well, stylistically, he should just, like, charge forward and wreck him. And that's exactly what happened. So he's just not getting a lot of respect. And definitely with Nganu's like, star power, he is um, getting overshadowed, even though he's also going for a record. Nobody's ever defended the heavyweight title three times. Um, yeah, is that incredible? So, it's just crazy. Crazy. So I just, thought, I just thought Brock Lesnar like would have beaten it. Like it seemed like he was kind of going against a bunch of, shall we say, not the best <laughs> guys. Diverticulitis, man. <laughs> da, I'm a diverticulitis. <laughs> took an air, took an arrow to the diverticulitis. Yep. <laughs> so he's got, he's got. By he, I mean Stipe, not that other guy who does all the other drugs. Um. Stipe is going to be smart and learn from his best mistakes. He's going to continue to stalk people down. He will not back up 
in the face of aggression in the first round, and he will probably avoid getting hit with any super heavy shots within the first minute or two. Um, but there you is think, also a do good you think sh- holding his ground is the best decision for Stipe? No, he's gonna he's gonna move forward. You think he's gonna move forward? Yeah. You think he'll pressure Francis? I think he's gonna pressure Francis. Okay. Uh, I don't know how Francis is gonna respond to that because um, they both kind of like to move forward. Uh, although Stipe is more of a stalker. Um, uh, I really see him getting in like close, closer range to avoid um, Ngannou's reach, um, possibly going to his wrestling, but I don't know. I mean, I thought he would go to his wrestling at other points, too, and he never did, and uh, he hasn't had to a lot either. Um, obviously, either of them have knockout power and could win in the first round, but usually when there's, like this like massive power level with two guys it's like bro it's both of them are over 9000 it usually doesn't end in the first round cuz there's like a feeling out period and people being smarter or safer yeah so i'm not sure how that will affect uh francis's cardio we haven't seen him go very far at all cuz he's just like wrecking people so fast um and don't know if um Steve A might be counting on that going past the first round, so he might utilize his wrestling earlier to to give himself a little advantage later on. But I definitely, it's definitely possible for either person to win. But I think Steve A is definitely getting not enough respect for Francis. I just don't know if there's like there's not a lot of tape to go on for his opponent, but like also for himself. I, I forgot who brought this this up but i was listening to some podcast that was talking about this fight and francis kind of has that it's not like beginner's luck but it's just kind of he's so naturally talented and gifted that things are just sort of working for him right now like he kind of made some mistakes got pushed up against the fence in in that fight against hamilton and then was able to turn that around into a kimura like in a in a setup that like nobody that does jujitsu, especially against a guy who had a brown belt in jujitsu, nobody in their right mind would ever try to go for a Kimura from that position. And he landed it. So in his mind, he's like, yeah, 100% success rate. That's easy. If I get there, that works for me. <laughs> you know, yeah. whereas no one else, like other people wouldn't even try that because maybe they have done that before, like, and it didn't work for them. And so it's like in their head, they're like, that's not a smart decision. I, I could fail doing that. Let's do something else. This guy, it just seems like everything that he's doing it's kind of working, and each time we see him fight, he's just—he's like a computer. He, I, I think that's one of his underrated skills is that he, how quickly he's, he's learning the game and how quickly he adapts mid-fight. But we are still talking about the champ. I just want to follow up on what you're saying. Uh, he, he does have a, a pressure style, but I, I think he's also comfortable playing that counter game and, and, and letting guys sort of chase him and make a mistake. Uh, I would point to that Verdum fight where Verdum came out very aggressive. And Stipe, Stipe was like, fine, if that's the way you want to play it, I will play the patient game, back up, wait for my shot. He hit him with a shot that I, I, I don't know if that was a kill shot. I think it was just kind of like a, a make, make room kind of shot to set up something else. If you saw him, he was still in a stance to, to, to throw something else. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. you know, this is a guy, he, he, he did MMA. And he was like, my boxing isn't good enough. He went and he did boxing, became a, a go gold boxer. He has very good boxing fundamentals. Everything is kind of set up behind his, his jabs and his feints. He kind of like angles in, angles out, uh, just to kind of figure out where his opponent likes to fight, where they like to throw stuff from. Um, and I think the one thing about M- Miosik that he's just sort of kind of like his, his superb skill, he, he has this instinctual ability to know when to pull his punch, like to know when, uh-oh, something's about to get counter. You could just see him, he'll, he'll, he'll throw and then like, uh-oh, and back back off a bit and then kind of, uh, you know, push himself out at an angle. Very Stephen Thompson-like. If you see him very heavy on that back foot, he, and uh, I think that's with that in mind, you know, a lot of his stuff, m- most of his fight, even when he's pressuring guys, is just setting stuff up. 
feeling it out. It's like, wait, wait, wait. And then once he counters, he blitzes. Then he goes at you, heavy on the front leg, multiple combinations, and gets in close. And that's that's kind of where I see this the the uh, the intrigue of this fight for me is that you have on one hand a master of a guy, a, a guy who is a master at fighting in close quarters in Stipe Miocic, um, versus a guy who seems to be a master at fighting from distance in Francis Ngannou. Tyler, I'm going to get to you now. How do you feel about the uh, the champs' chances in this fight? Uh, you know, anytime you can steep a your cuppa i think that's a win right that, you used it you used I, it <laughs> approved, <laughs> approved. <laughs> uh here's here's it took him an hour this. to come up with that one yeah it did and i was really <laughs> proud of it and i wrote it down and everything um it, this fight is really exciting because the Ninganu knockout of overeem like fits beautifully on a gif right it got everywhere immediately Jeff. And it allows the UFC in an era where guys are so technical that you now have to rely on. We kind of talked about it earlier. You have to start leaning on those sort of WWE aspects, the pro wrestling stuff, because just the fight on its own is so technical. Now, if you want to bring in new people, you have to find common ground. Right. And the easiest way to do that is to find exciting things. And Nganu's knockout ability is the most exciting thing in heavyweight. And he's like, he's the heavyweight that may have to cut this week to make sure he hits 265. Mm-hmm. And he's got the crazy knockout power. They haven't had that guy in a little while, right? So why not put this guy in a rocket ship and put him up against the champ and get as many butts in seats as you can when you had to call central booking for the rest of the fight, right? But six years in this fight game, I don't know that Ngannou's really like set for this championship fight. And Miocic is such a technically fantastic fighter. I mean, you're, you're saying it. Like he knocked a guy out with a throwaway punch backing away. I don't know we've seen that a few times in the UFC, but it's always fun. But the fact that he can pull that off, that says a lot about his process and his planning and his actual fight style. And I don't think even though you put the guy with potentially the strongest punch currently in the UFC in there, I don't think that's enough to go ahead and say, this guy's going to walk away with the uh, celebratory champagne bath on Saturday night. Like Stipe is right now solidly the best heavyweight in the UFC. And uh, Nganu is going to be around for a while, and his fights are going to be fantastic. But as far as winning the title, not right now. Not against Miocic. Yeah, I think it behooves the champion to uh, sprinkling his uh, his wrestling background in this fight. Not so much to, to take down Francis and control him, but just to make Francis work tire him out do do whatever you can and then maybe put some damage on him you know i think if you go back and this is why i don't think i know some people are saying dude stipe needs to take him to the ground at all costs that's the only way he can win and i'm like you, you know francis without much wrestling like training has already shown that he instinctively sort of knows what to do in those situations i i watched that fight against uh him against curtis blades who has some uh you know, wrestling chops himself. And even when Curtis was able to take him down, he, he he had a hard time even controlling him. And this was Curtis, when he took him down, wasn't in a position to really land any ground and found. He wasn't really playing a, uh, you know, an aggressive game. It was very conservative. He was trying to hold him and, and, and pressure him and he couldn't just pure strength and, and, and just instincts. And Francis was able to get back on his feet. So I don't know if Stipe is in there going, Hey, you know what? I need to take him to the ground. And that's, that's my path to victory. I think, I think his strength, Miosha's strength, is his all-around game. He's one of the most fundamentally sound fighters in that heavyweight division. Maybe the most well-rounded fighter in heavyweight history. It's just the different skill sets that he can bring, his boxing, his wrestling, his grappling, everything. And he's, he's good at all of it. So I think for him to beat a monster like Francis, it's going to take... Um, it's going to take all a little bit of everything. He's going to have to make Francis work. And 
look, and we, we were we were bringing this up a little bit earlier too. These are heavyweights. It's just physics. Top level heavyweights, they can knock each other out. So yeah, everyone's going to talk about Francis's power, and yes, it's impressive. Also, can I just call in the question that you know the strongest punch in in combat sports? How many guys have punched that machine? I mean, how many guys have actually like, <laughs> like do we know? I mean, like it was like this is the strongest punch ever between Francis Ngano and then the one technician guy that like punched it for fun just to see if it was working. I mean, how many people? Like do we like So, are you saying I need to get my tool bag and go recalibrate that machine? Is that yeah. what you're saying? <laughs> I mean, no, I, I'm saying I think you need to put on your boxing gloves, go down there, punch it, and then see if maybe you might be the best puncher. <laughs> I also now have a punch like a sledgehammer. <laughs> like, Can I use my sledgehammer while I punch? <laughs> um, so going back to uh, his last fight, and I think that also plays into the public perception because we were we were talking about this, and I think the three of us found it kind of surprising how everyone is going for Francis. The public, I think... He has captured the public's imagination. They're like, they, this is like the next Tyson or something. The guy's just going to wreck through everyone, and people love that. And I get that. But the fact that, like, the analysts are, are smitten over him, and everyone, like, like, a lot of these professional analysts are Joe calling. Joe Rogan. Said, yeah. Joe um, can, big time proponent of Ngannou. Ken, Kenny Florian also thought that, uh, he just thought that it would be too tough to avoid Ninganu that long. Well, he was he was talking from Miyoshi's standpoint. It was too it was too hard. The guy is too big, too long, too fast, too powerful. I agree with all of that. So I'm gonna. You, you, it sounds like you guys are going for the champ, and I I definitely see where you're coming from, and I definitely do think that it's a little disrespectful, just kind of how <laughs> little credit he is being given uh, going into this fight. But I, I, I'm just gonna bring up some stuff. Uh, just from Ninganu's uh, perspective, one, you know, for a guy that has all this athletic ability and all of this this crazy knockout power, usually when you talk about guys like that, the narrative is, you know, maybe flawed fundamentals, or or, or maybe a little bit impatient, maybe or maybe he relies on that too much and he doesn't have too much else in his game. And the thing that I really like Ninganu, refreshingly, he doesn't really rely on that stuff to get the job done. He's actually very patient. If you look at him, I. I I kind of feel like it's a lot like Anderson Silva in that first round where not a lot's going on. He kind of feels you out, and it's almost like he's like a computer, kind of sees how you move, and and he's he's very intelligent. You go back to that Orlovsky fight, it, and he, when, when Orlovsky was punching, he kind of saw how Orlovsky was setting those punches up. Parry, combo. All right. Next time he tried the parry, moved the hand, took Orlovsky out of position, and then he countered. He is really good at making his opponents uncomfortable uh, when they're striking. He never wants to give them the advantage. So you're either at a 50-50 position with Ninganu where he takes his chances because he's generally the longer and the stronger uh, fighter, or you gave Ninganu the advantage by overcommitting. It's the other thing about Ninganu's game. He loops all of his shots. If you, if you see it, it it's, it's really crazy uh, looking. It's like Stretch Armstrong, and he's just kind of like... And, you know, people would say that's not, you know, the best technique. It's it's great for for power and and it looks great when it lands like it did against um, Overeem and it <laughs> pops his head back like a Pez dispenser. But the thing is, he somehow he makes it work for, for him. He's throwing punches that should throw you off balance. It, it's what you call overcommitting on a shot. And you see Conor McGregor do this sometimes when he when he kind of loads up on that overhand. And he steps through into it. It usually takes guys down so he doesn't have to worry too much. And he just kind of relies on his uh, natural instincts and, and quickness to get out of the way. Francis never puts himself out of position when, when he swings like that. Even though it looks like he's swinging wildly, his legs and base are always under him. Another thing I really like about Francis is he, it, it almost looks like he kind of takes a page out of uh, taekwondo fighters. When he moves his legs, he moves both feet at the same time, both positions them both. Um, so that way he's always balanced. He's got his base underneath them. And we got to check on this. I don't know <laughs> if he's actually left-handed or not. He fights orthodox. He is knocking fools out with his left hand, like, all the time. He's got crazy power there. And 
it's it's kind of funny because the way he fights, he he kind of pushes his opponents to their left side and and he angles that way because he's trying to set up his right straight which he was knocking people out with early in his career and I think now he's kind of learning that people know that about him and and it's kind of scary because he's if you remember kind of like Dan Henderson the way he fought he always tried to load up move people into his right his what they call the h-bomb if they went the other way, it was almost like they negated this entire attack. He really didn't have much from his left to really make them pay for it. Now, picture that now with Francis Ngannou, who can make you pay with the left. It makes it really scary. Um, and then, as I brought up before, I, I think that Miosic, it, it does behoove the champ to, to try to grapple with this guy and take him down, if, if anything else, just to tire him out a little bit, tax his body. Um, but Francis, to his credit, without the wrestling background that Miosic has, has shown great takedown defense, even early on in his career, without a proper coach teaching him this wrestling. And now we have essentially the UFC's Ivan Drago. I mean, they're hooking up with all these like high-tech machines. Yeah. They're bringing him to the, the, the best gym that money can buy. Meals that are catered for his body type, coaches that are catered just to him. The UFC is all in in Francis Ngannou. They want this guy to win. And it feels like just yesterday we were, we were breaking down this fight with Overy. And that just tells you what a beast he is. He fought a fight last month, but it was so easy for him. He is ready to go for a, a title shot now. So um, what is his game plan? What does his game plan need to be? Well, I went back and I watched Miocic's last fight. And I know a lot of people, they watch that JDS fight. And they're like, JDS got his butt kicked. Like, Miocic destroyed him. That's true. He, he, did, he did destroy JDS in that rematch. But one of the things JDS was able to do was, in between combinations, he also was able to hit Miocic's lead leg. And Miocic, even though he is heavy on his back leg, when he blitzes, he will go heavy on that lead leg. You can chop down at that. That's going to take down a little bit of that... Uh, a little bit of the um, the power from Stipe's also re- remarkably dangerous right hand. Let's not let's not talk about the champ like he doesn't have knockout power himself. I think he's going to have to take a page out of JDS's book there and 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 work work the leg kicks. He's he's shown those leg kicks before, but um, they weren't really refined and they were leading to him getting taken down and being taken down by guys that may not have had the wrestling pedigree that Stipe did. So if he, he kind of throws a weaker leg kick against Stipe, I think Stipe is going to catch it and put him on his back. So I, I think he's going to have to work the leg, just play his patient game um, and, and just kind of jab, keep, keep Miocic. If he plays this game and keep Miocic at distance, I think he already has the advantage because Miocic naturally wants to close that distance. It, it, you throw in the fact that he has to against a longer fighter that plays more into Francis's game because Francis kind of naturally, if he just controls the distance is already where he wants to fight. Stipe has to be the one that has to be a little bit more aggressive or, you know, quote unquote, take the risk in order to fight the game that he wants to fight. Not that he can't do that. The champ is very skilled at doing that. I'm just saying that the, uh, the advantage is in Francis's corner just to start off those exchanges. I think he has to take advantage of them. I think he needs to be smart. Early on in his career, he winged a lot of shots. I think he's going to have to pick his shots. He has to be very smart against the champ, who's a very smart fighter himself. I think if he does these things, though, um, I think it'll just be a matter of time. His defense is really good. His takedown defense is is pretty good. And like I said, he's like a computer. I think one of his greatest skill sets is not his, you know, ginormous muscles and like super fast speed and athleticism and all of that. I really think it's his brain. He, he's only been in the sport, like you said, Tyler, six years. Look at the improvements he's made every single fight. You look at him in the first fight, he could barely land an uppercut. Now his uppercut is like his go-to move. It's incredible how much this guy's improved i think we're gonna see even more improvement in this fight is it enough was it enough improvement to close that gap with the champ i don't know this this like i I forgot who brought it up but like stipe like he was already like you know six seven eight fights deep before francis even knew what mma was he was a boxer he wanted to be a boxer so there's a there was a big gap but Francis, he just seems to be one of those natural, like, it just comes naturally to him. And I, I think that's a real asset, his brain, his ability to um, not only learn the sport, but make adjustments mid-fight. If you, if you watch against Overeem, Overeem knew um, going in, he had a game plan of, okay, 
Francis wants to counter here, and he set him up. And just instinctively, Francis kind of saw, oh, shoot, he moved a little bit differently, abort, moved out of the way, and then was able to counter himself. That's not really something you can teach. That's just something that, that some people have. Stipe has that, too. I think this is going to be a really good fight. And they're both really tough guys, so we might actually get to see a, a couple rounds of some pretty awesome heavyweight heavyweights go at it. And I agree with you, Matt. I, I think there's going to be a big filling out process. That's par for course for Francis because um, he just likes to feel guys out in the first round anyways. I think Stipe, you know, he like like Stipe said, he's like, look, I, it's not like I don't see the videos too. I forgot. I think it was Daniel Cormier that said, look, I went against Anthony Johnson. So for Stipe, it's going to be kind of like that. Yeah, you see a bunch of highlights of a guy that has crazy knockout power. That doesn't mean like, oh, no, I'm afraid of this guy. It just means, okay, now we game plan for a guy with crazy knockout power. We've, we've game plan for other guys with other skills. So um, I think Stipe actually said like, Oh, those are nice videos. I have videos too. <laughs> no, yeah. them. Poor guy. Poor guy. The volunteer. You got the volunteer firefighter. It's like a like a, a Rocky story or something. The volunteer firefighter versus like this lab created UFC monster. <laughs> Francis right. Ngannou. Um, Francis is actually from his earlier interviews. He does seem like a really cool, like chill guy. Like obviously his English has gotten a lot better in the last few years, but he does seem like a cool guy. I think um, now that he is in that position to be the man. He's got to pick up the uh, the trash talking a bit. So I think that's kind of why you're hearing the whole, oh, you won't last against me. I, I must break you. <laughs> I must break you. <laughs> Someone told him, he was like on a, a radio show promoting the fight, and they were like, everyone on our show is asking you, please, can you say I must break you? And he said in like the nicest way possible. <laughs> that's such a, you have such a nice voice. <laughs> you sound like such a nice guy for someone that is so scary. 20 um, years from now, they're going to be in an expendable spinoff together. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. I'm down for that. I'll bankroll it. Yeah. And, you know, Stallone, with the Bitcoin. Hey, yep. if, if Stallone takes enough HGH, he'll be in that movie too. Um, any, you any, mean any, if the HGH wears off by that point. <laughs> <laughs> um, do we have any, uh, any other thoughts on this fight? Just open floor. It, uh, it's kind of funny. Like, it's so weird how there's just no other highly intriguing fights. And that's not to knock the other fighters, but like, man, what a weird card to come together. And a bunch of guys are not going to make it for injury or whatever else have you, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of, it reminds me of some of the older UFCs where you have no idea who's fighting before the main, but you know, you came to watch Tito. And so you're hanging in there so you can watch Tito, right? Like, it's kind of one of those. It's sort of fun. It's throwback, I guess. Yeah, I guess we're kind of spoiled more now as fight fans. Um, and then plus, just as the sport gets bigger, the talent pool gets a little bit bigger, too. So there's just a lot more guys that are Tito Ortiz level. Matt, did you have any other thoughts? Um, I'm not sure, but... Kyle Bosniak's going to win just because we said he was going to win last time and then he didn't. So he, he has to win. win this time, right? Yeah. And plus he's in Boston. And he's in Boston. He's a, he's a, he's a Patriots fan. Is he, is yeah. Davis out though? Uh, He'll find somebody. That's what you were saying. Yeah. Hopefully they, um, they put something together. This is a uh, kind of ridiculous. Hamasi yeah. and Razak Al Hassan. That would have been a, I was telling Tyler earlier that would have been <laughs> a David special. <laughs> yeah, I think that about wraps up our coverage of uh, this incredible fight weekend, January 20th. We got both UFC 220 and Bellator 192. And I just mentioned his name, David. He does do um, pickums for every single fight card. He will be dropping that, I believe, sometime this week. So keep an eye out for that one also matt is always working on stuff behind the scenes he's got another rattling the cage ready for us uh he says that it will probably just take you know a, a couple days to a month to get together no problem <laughs> i had to go into hiding i got too many death threats so i was like change my identity yeah. sorry it's just that much fire it is, it is so much fire. And Tyler, of course, we always appreciate it. When you come on, starting to become a little bit more of a regular uh, 
We're, we're gonna start uh, giving him some stuff. He's gonna have his own exclusive content, mainly about like George St. Pierre's eating habits, aliens, um, hockey, which apparently is big up there. Curling is big up in, in yep. Canada. And yep, I, we uh, just coming off the big time briars, getting ready for the Olympics up here right now. Yeah, M- Margaret and I are going over to um, we're going over to Scotland, and they have like the like the the national like international headquarters for for curling. <laughs> over there, I was like, dang, I really just want to do it once just to see what it's like. Have you ever tried I it? The, I think the quarry's still over there. Yeah. Have you ever curled before, Tyler? You're asking me? Yeah. Well, You're, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> What, I'm not, were, were you the I'm one not that like the were, Canadian were, Olympic team? Were, 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 you, were you the but. one that like what do you who do you? I don't even know the names. There's a guy with the bro- there are two guys with the brooms like the sweepers, yeah, sweepers. and yeah, then the sweepers. one guy that throws the stone. Or not throws, but I guess kind of like it's the rock. Yeah, it's the rock. Pick up the rock. I thought I had the right turn. <laughs> slide <laughs> the rock. Mm-hmm. Slide yep. the rock. Yeah. So which which were you? Were you a sweeper or a slider? Well, you rotate through. Oh, okay. Yeah, I know nothing so about this sport. Yeah, everybody everybody gets a turn throwing the rock. Um, we have other sports like like basketball and baseball in, in, the, in the States. <laughs> well, it's really hard to play basketball when your court is covered with three American feet of snow. So <laughs> That is true. You guys don't have indoor courts? That, those are for pansies. <laughs> Tyler calling every single NBA player a pansy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> at me bro <laughs> come at him Draymond Green <laughs> yeah where are you at take everyone on alright guys I do appreciate doing this and guys you need to be tuning in this weekend UFC 220 Bellator 192 and until next time guys we are the bros bros you know <laughs> <laughs>